again The stormy seas we fight the wind From broken dreams to hope we send A message clear will never bend In darkest nights we find our flame Through tears and joy it burns the same We see the truth beyond the fame Together we will make our claim Hands held high, let's reach the sky this one will never die Feel the love and hear the cry Of hearts that beat in perfect time No chains can hold, no walls can find We break them down with hearts divine In unity our stars align Our spirit loud, our souls entwine One voice echoes through the night in shadows dark we shine so bright With every step we take in flight We reach new heights, we'll never bear a bear Hands of violence reach the sky Found this one will never die Feel the love and hear the cry Of hearts that beat in perfect time One will never die Feel the love and hear the cry Of hearts that beat in perfect time No chains can hold, no walls can fight We break them down with hearts nearby In unity our stars align Of hearts that beat in perfect time Hey, welcome everybody to the Garden Freed, the Freedom Garden Club podcast show. This is your host, Sean Starry. Today we have an interview with Jason Magoria, and we are going to be talking about uh, foreign policy. And this is an interesting subject because this is something that we've been dealing with for the last 250 years, and we've seen some ups and downs, some successes and not so successful. Uh, as in this in this administration, anyway, um, and Jason is going to be sharing his views from the United Party on foreign policy. Hey, welcome, uh, Jason Lagoria. Hey, hey, Jason, how are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. I'm I excited. Like the, the trim job looks great. <laughs> yeah, just uh, just a little uh, shedding for the winter. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about foreign policy. This is this is one that uh, a lot of foreign countries right now are, are have been kind of harping, uh, knowing that Trump is going to be in office, and they're already talking about foreign policy. So we want to kind of cover this with you today and get your your views on this and what the, the views of the United Party would be, what it would look like. So. Um, the first question I have for you today is, should the U.S. prioritize diplomatic solutions over military intervention, or are there situations where military actions is justified to achieve foreign policy goals? I think that the view of the United Party would start to fall under diplomacy before military intervention. Military intervention should be something that is a absolute last resort, at least in my opinion. And I'll tell you why. We have the technology to go out and decimate just about any country we, we would like to. Is that the right way to go about it? I don't think so. I think that it would hurt things in the long run. And one of the bigger problems I see in diplomacy today is they're never thinking about the long term. They're always thinking about the quick solution 
and not worrying about the catastrophes that it'll cause down the road. So in particular, you know, you can argue that diplomacy should be the primary tool in foreign policy because it promotes peaceful conflict resolution, right? And we talked about conflict resolution. Right. It also fosters international cooperation and reduces the risk of war, which are, which are all good things. But on the same token, military intervention, in some cases, requires us to show our strength and direct action as it's necessary to protect the national interest. So we can't be pushed around. So, and, and some countries we're gonna find, they're gonna respond to aggression and uh, they're, they're gonna pipe down really quickly. And it would all have to be in the sake of, of maintaining global stability, right? Because one of the things that we have to take into consideration is, are our actions going to cause an international conflict between two allies or adversaries or an ally and an adversary? And we don't really want to be the ones in the middle because I think what we're seeing a lot now with what's happening in the world is we're being proxied into wars that are not our issues. And that's another thing that we have to discuss at some point is what is the line of our involvement in a conflict between two countries that don't involve us, but because of our treaties and our involvement in NATO, we've signed on to support them despite what the argument's actually about. Right. And, and that seems to be kind of a pressing issue. <laughs> what's, what's going on with, uh, say, for example, like with Ukraine and Russia, um, which is really interesting because, you know, uh, Trump had a policy in order where he was using a lot of diplomacy to achieve world peace. And as soon as he left office and Biden got in, he reascended all of those uh, plans that Trump had. And the first thing they did was they intercepted Zelensky and told him that they were taking a different course of action, which then ended up resulting in this conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Um, and that's it, you know, this has been going on for four years and, you know, we've had a lot of lives lost unnecessarily, not to mention agriculture loss and financial loss. Um, and we have a lot of our taxpayer dollars just going right out the window uh, to fund this, this conflict. <laughs> but what people aren't talking about <clears throat> is how the corporations, uh, I want to call it the military industrial complex, and how they played such a large part in, this, just the, uh, in the starting of or the creation of the conflicts. Um, and as far as the military industrial complex goes, uh, what would be your approach to them as regarding to trying to establish diplomacy with the world? So that that's a really good question because that has so many moving parts in it. And it is, it is used to using their strength to sway decisions of other nations. So I feel like the military industrial complex needs to be um, broken up into more diplomatic um, practicality. You know what I mean? Like we will call on you if it's absolutely necessary to step mm -hmm. in. Otherwise, we should not have them playing any role in the decisions of our policies and treaties that we make with other countries. They are the force and we don't want to rule the world. That's not our purpose. So if we go back to, you know, bringing a lot of our industries back home where we're not involved in a lot of these trade wars that are happening right now, mm -hmm. I think that we can, we can settle them into a much more comfortable position rather than being the, the brunt of everything. Keeping people in fear is not something that the United Party supports in any capacity. No one should live in fear, no matter what nation you live in. You should be able to enjoy your life. I agree. I, I'm pretty sure a lot of my viewers here agree as well. Uh, we're, we're tired of this whole fear propaganda uh, that's been kind of shoved down our throats through the mainstream media. So that kind of brings me to my next question. Um, 
that I want to just kind of highlight. Uh, so should the U.S. Uh, use a trade policy and economics sanctions as a preliminary tools in foreign policy strategy, or do these measures have detrimental effects that outweigh the benefits? Well, I think what we're talking about really is the multilateralism versus unilateral unilateral lateralism, right? Sorry about that. <laughs> so if you're talking about multilateralism, it's like using things like NATO to enhance global cooperation. But to me, it's, it sounds much more like you're being a bully because if you're not part of NATO, then you're just subject to what we give you or do to you or apply upon your nation. And I don't think that's really good um, way to to say that we're a diplomatic nation. I think that makes us seem like we're going to force you into it, whether you like it or not. Right. And I'm not sure I really like that so much. And, you know, they, they want to say that they're, they're sharing the burden across a bunch of different leaders, but it's like a good old boys club. What are you really sharing? Cause you're all going to get something out of it. You're all forcing somebody or a country, a nation to do something that they're not really interested in doing. And then you're trying to walk around like you're the good guy. So I'm not so sure I'm, I'm really on board with that. And, you know, this is something that the United Party will develop through those doctrines over this next, you know, barbecue run we're going to do in the summer. Um, but then you talk about unilateralism and it's like that allows the U.S. to respond more swiftly and decisively to threats without being constrained by international consensus or bureaucracy. So I kind of feel like we would lean more towards unilateralism only under the premise that using the military industrial complex as a last resort if things really go belly up. Otherwise, we always talk about how things need to be fair. Mm -hmm. We talk about that a lot in the United States with wages, with education, with poverty, homelessness. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So if you are going to um, provide the methodology of leadership by example, then we need to start those examples here within our country. And then as we choose better leadership, I think our diplomacy skills will increase and um, the level of fairness amongst the United States and other countries will tend to level out at a much better place than it is currently. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that we find is that we go to a country where everything is really, really inexpensive. We throw up this huge amount of infrastructure. We put whatever industry in there that's going to bank off of that country's back. And when it's all done, we close up shop and split. So in essence, what we've done is we've taken a third world country. We've increased their economics to um, a place that's never been before almost overnight. And then we leave them in the dust and now they're left holding the bag and they have no industry to support the um, economy that we built there, right? So it really does more damage than good. So I think we need more forethought in how we're gonna do it. And I think a mixture of both multilateralism and, and unilateralism is something that could benefit everybody in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it is, it's kind of like, you know, through diplomacy, we can solve a lot more problems with, I mean, you could track more flies with honey than you could with vinegar. So if we, you know, if the United Party had the approach of, we fix what's, we fix what's wrong here, and we make our economy so attractive that all the other nations want to have what we have, and then we can provide that structure to them without causing any financial harm. Uh, and I think that's, that approach is probably be the best way to go because I think a lot of my viewers agree with me on this and, and uh, we're just tired of having to go to war, saying or sending our sons and daughters to fight in a conflict that really it has nothing to do with the United States in uh, a uh, 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 general sense as if we were being invaded <clears throat> this is more a diplomatic problem it's kind of like uh it's like saying you know is this a criminal problem or is this a civil case problem right and 
it seems like the last four years has been more of a civil problem rather than a criminal problem. So I think the approach that the Biden administration has taken has been a horrendous one. I think his policies have been nothing but destructive uh, in, in every sense. And at the same time, he's making us pay for it. Um, and so when we talk about alliances, uh, I want to bring this up to the next question. So with alliances and partnerships, uh, should the U.S. be focused on strengthening, strengthening existing alliances and forming new partnerships, or should it reassess and potentially reduce the commitments to avoid entanglements and global conflicts? Well, I would argue that maintaining and strengthening alliances with countries like Japan, South Korea, and European nations enhance collectively security, shares, defense burdens, and and counters adverse adversaries, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the flip side to that is that excessive reliance on al uh, alliances can drag the U.S. into conflicts that don't align with our interests. And alliances should not constrain the U.S. foreign policy flexibility. So putting us in that position kind of is a double-edged sword. And I think that where we're at right now is we've agreed to more than we should have. And now again, by not forecasting what our decisions of yesterday are going to cause for today and tomorrow is now starting to come to light based on the policies that were implemented by our last administration. And right now we're in how many different conflicts, like three different major conflicts across the globe. We are having so many problems at home that, you know, it's almost like the American people feel like they haven't counted for the last three and a half years. Um, they've been fed a line of hogwash and horse shit about where we stand in the grand scheme of things. And now trying to backpedal because they're out of office here in the next two months, you know, it, or I'm sorry, four months or so. It's going to take a, a lot of unwinding for the new administration now that is a strain on our resources like no other because we've got a lot of things to cover in four years we know that you know the new administration has only got four years they're not going to be up for re-election we don't have time to do all this backpedaling so i really feel like the way that we create our alliances and partnerships needs to be based on an equal value of what can be provided by both nations right. and the outcome has to be something that can be supported globally as much as possible we're not going to get along with every country and neither our allies or partnerships are going to have countries that they're all going to get along with and here's where the problem begins we get along with some of the countries that our allies do not and then what do we do we buy from our allies to sell to their adversaries mm -hmm. so this starts to become a real mess as their leadership changes and now you want new alliances and partnerships and relationships to be built. But because of the previous administrations and not just the Biden administration, keep going back, in, you know, 50 years. We need to stop looking at yesterday and today and start looking more into tomorrow so that we can actually build a future. Because I really believe that if we start working on policies and alliances and partnerships and treaties, then we will have less sanctions to apply to people because if we make people, and I say people loosely as in the countries that they're from, rely on their own resources and help them build their own futures, then we won't have to worry about sanctions or pulling the plug on things or getting involved in international conflicts that are not our issue. And then we won't have any um, ownership to our alliances and partnerships to be proxied into their problems. I agree. I agree a hundred percent. Um, that kind of leads me to my next question. You know, we're talking about, uh, uh, humanitarian intervention. <clears throat> so, you know, and I think this is the question that a lot of, a lot of our viewers want to know is should the U S undertake humanitarian interventions to address the global crisis or should it focus on national interest? and avoid potential pitfalls of international involvement? Well, let's say it this way. How do you feel about the World Economic Forum? 
and the World Health Organization. Not very good. Nobody does. So essentially what we're saying in this, you know, this, this question is that should we participate in humanitarian intervention? My, my answer to that is no. We, we don't belong in any place on any council telling the world what they need to do. If everybody respects the planet as they should, then we shouldn't have these issues to begin with, right? Everybody uh -huh. deserves clean drinking water. Everybody de deserves access to medical care. Everybody deserves access to healthy food. Uh -huh. And again, if we provide the direction, the support, we can build up all of these different nations to have access to these things without breaking them, without putting some sort of you owe me on it. We would be more humanitarian, would we not? Because that's right. what it really means. It means we're going to be humanitarian. We're going to go down to some of these countries that don't have running water and we're going to have everybody in, in our you know little group of, of partners because I don't want to say alliances. I want to say partners because as partners, we all want this nation to have fresh water and medical care. And you know what? We all got a little money to kick in. So we can go down there. We can set them up, but we have to build them an infrastructure that they can support. We can't just go down there and put a quick mandate on it. We have to build an infrastructure they can support in their communities. So again, if we go back to our very first conversation about education, that would be the good starting point, right? Let them educate us first on their community, on, on their ethnic background, on their culture. And then we help them define a educational system, a workforce. Um, and then, you know, the medicine and all of the necessities we already have. So we can just kick them down to you. You know, we can we can kick them down to you. You're not going to build a pharmaceutical manufacturing plant. We know that. Yep. But we already manufacture those. So you know what? Once our administration comes in and we level set like how much medication is going to cost, they don't need to become billionaires by killing people. But there are some basic fundamentals that we need to understand. Like penicillin is one of those things that every nation should have in their cabinet. Any type of antibiotic. You know, anything that's going to help them get over whatever sickness they're having. But if we do the investigations appropriately, and when I say investigations, I mean learning their culture, understanding the area in the world they live in, what their major hurdles are, and then right. saying, hey, this is what we're going to do to support you in this, but we're not going to carry you. We're going to teach you how to fish so you can eat all the time. We're not going to keep cooking fish for you. Exactly, exactly. You know, it's like it says in the Bible. If you teach a man how to, if you feed a man for a day, uh, you'll feed him, you know, the next day and the day on and so on. But if you teach a man how to fish, he'll feed, feed himself for a lifetime. That's right. You know? <clears throat> and, you know, I know that we've had this discussion many, many times. We talked about climate change and, you know, um, and international relations concerning climate change, the World Economic Forum. Um, and it's pretty much the same conversation I have with a lot of my viewers and, um, but, uh, I just, I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you this question and then, uh, let the viewers kind of, uh, you know, maybe you can extrapolate, uh, on this question here, when in regards to climate change and international relations. So should the U S immigration policy be aligned with diplomatic strategies? to improve international relations, or should it focus on national security and its own economic concerns? Well, I think that actually is more about immigration policy and international relations, more so than applying to climate change and environmental policy. But I would probably say, you know, we can argue that having an open and fair immigration policy can improve relations with other countries, foster global talent exchange and, and enhance national security through better integration. On the other hand, lax immigration policies constrain resources, increase security risks and create diplomatic tensions with countries that have stricter immigration controls. So it can't be this open-ended free for all. We have to figure out again, what a baseline is. And one of the things that we lack across the globe is a, is a typical baseline, right? We don't have right. one. 
We have a baseline for the United States, Canada, Europe, Mexico. The list goes on and on and on. So if you want to talk about, you know, your partnerships and uh, alliances, then I think together, if we're going to talk about these type of policies and relationships internationally, then then as a collective group, we need to say we're going to we're going to level set our policies across however many nations decide to participate. Right. right. So it's going to be the same to get into France as it is to the United States, as it is to Japan, as it is to, you know, Nicaragua. I mean, keep going on and on and on with the name of the countries. But we have to have like a basic standard of how they're going to get across, how they're going to come back, how we're going to interact with one another and not have, you know, it it is extremely difficult to get into Japan. Like most people that try to go to Japan cannot go there. Like their threshold for allowing people in is extremely high. Right. So they also have a very low crime rate. They also have a whole different culture. Now, the United States is not going to increase their immigration policy to that standard. Where can we meet in the middle? That's the question. Where can we meet in the middle? So yeah. if we take all the politicians out of it and le let's just say we leave this up to criminal justice experts, education experts and international uh, travel experts, then we can start coming to some resolutions without involving all the politics. I like that. I like that approach. You know, um, you know, when, when we're talking about like climate change, the World Economic Forum has got this handle on climate change in such a way that they've had this They've had this, this influence over so many countries with this whole concept of carbon tax. Now, for my, a lot of my viewers out there that don't understand, um, you get a chance, just go look up uh, in the Webster Dictionary, what does, you know, what is carbon, right? What you're going to find is that every living thing on this planet is carbon-based. So yeah. what they're essentially saying is... It's a human tax, right? So, because we're carbon based, so we're, it's just the whole thing is, it's nothing more than a Ponzi scheme uh, to, to lead people astray. Because, and the reality is, is that they're collecting all this money. And it's not being used for the things that they say it's supposed to be used for. Um, <clears throat> instead of just, you know, coming out and say, listen, well, we need to, we need to figure out a way to come up with some money. To pay for the infrastructure we got bridges falling down we've got roads that are you know terrible um but let's let's just focus on this spe specific part of what it is that we need to deal with but instead they just say carbon tax and carbon tax is such a broad term it, it, it's almost as if it's, it's a a non-fictional word that they came up with or it's a fictional word that they came up with where they just apply that to everything every issue every policy and but the thing is there's no transparency we, we have no idea where that money's going um yeah, that allows for a lot of politicians to be corrupt with the money um and part of that problem uh we're seeing is is how they're uh trying to use carbon tax as a way of saying well you know it's part of national security right it's part of national security but we don't know exactly how much of that is actually going to national security. And even a lot of the financial pundits out there, uh, they don't have an exact figure. And that should be a major red flag, I think, for many people, because uh, we've had a lot of like cyber attacks, <clears throat> especially in the last four years, we've had more cyber attacks in the last four years than we've had um, in the previous 25, 30 years. So, um, and that kind of leads me up to my next question is, is should the U.S. Uh, prioritize, prioritize cybersecurity and digital diplomacy in its foreign policy? Or should other areas of international engagement uh, receive equal or greater focus? Cybersecurity, I feel, is... It's a very large landscape because it it crosses every technological environment. So at some level, 
we obviously have to implement security against anything. But if you think about it in simpler terms, do you lock your car when it's in your driveway or just when you go to the store? So if you're going to go out and about and travel around the internet and you want to be able to make sure your credit cards are safe and that your banking information is safe, then we, we have to have a certain level of personal responsibility, right? And what, what happens when you sign up for something? You see them terms and agreements and you know, you get all the way to the bottom, you click OK, you put in your credit card number. And what people don't know is there's this disclaimer inside that agreement you just clicked OK on that says they're not responsible for your credit card information getting stolen. They take no liability. Nope. So you're using them as a segue to get to whatever sites you're going to. And they have no stake in the game to to make sure that your data is secure. And that's called fingerprinting. So every browser has this thing called fingerprinting. And what it does is it tracks all of your movements, all the sites you go to, where you spend your money, how you spend your money and what you spend your money on. Those things need to be stopped immediately because if we stopped allowing them to track all of our information, it would make it much more complicated for pirates is what I like to call them because let me just explain this briefly. Hacking is nothing more than tinkering. Like if when I was a kid, there was a guy down the street who had like a bunch of old copy machines and he'd be like, yeah, take one. And it had so many gears and like all kinds of cool shit inside there. You could take apart and make little robots and power it, you know, all this kind of stuff. Hacking is no more than tinkering. Pirates, however, or crackers is what we used to call them in our day, are people who have malicious intent to get your data, use it against you, steal from you so on and so forth. So I think that if we stop allowing all this content targeting, all these algorithms, and I know it sounds like a wild idea, but if we tell them they can't do that anymore, let it build on its own. It's gonna build eventually, but let it do it on its own. All you're doing is helping crackers and pirates have access to that information because they can now go in and they can use their toolkit to seek out what they're looking for because i'll tell you what and and this is a good example if they know that an individual spends a lot of time in the realm of pornography on the internet that makes them a lot more susceptible to getting their data stolen not because the pornography sites don't have good security but because you don't want to have to explain to your wife why and how they got your information when you've got all of these like you know, um, discreet charges on your credit card bill, but you know, they don't, they don't think about how much they're putting themselves out there. Yeah. They just don't think about that. And who do they really track on the internet when they want to commit a crime? The people that are doing something dirty, you know, they're not going after as many people as you think that are on there on Amazon doing stuff like that. They're going after people that are not going to say anything about it because they're more susceptible to getting taking the, the rap for the crime, claiming it to their bank because they don't want to be found out if they ever get brought into court. And they're like, well, what are all these discrete charges? Uh, you know, so, right. you know, I think that there's two sides to it. One, if we reinvent the domain naming structure structure and two, if we put the responsibility of the security of your system on the people that are trying to collect all your data. Yeah. So it's very important. And, you know, you can argue that enhancing cybersecurity and digital diplomacy is essential for protecting national security, economic interests, and maintaining a technological edge. However, if those are the things that are the problem, then you don't put them on the internet. If you have a research and development company, you have your private network that does not connect to the internet. If you want to send data, you build a process that is ultra secure from however you want to set up. Let's just say, for instance, you know, like in the movies, the NSA, their network is completely off everything. One computer that can access the internet that's in a very secure location, 4,000 feet underground, you know, put whatever on top of it you want. But 
that's how you send data to another location, not over the internet, but over a private network that is specifically built and designed that is impenetrable, right? That's where you want to use quantum computing first. Secure yeah. your shit. And, you know, you can also argue that focusing too much on cybersecurity can lead to the privacy concerns, overreach and digital surveillance and, and detract from other important diplomatic and security issues. So that is the fine line. When you start saying that you're going to um, apply so much on the privacy that you're basically opening it up for them to make sure that they have access to all of the things that you're doing on the Internet, that is a, a overreach like no other. And the way that they term it is they're trying to protect you. And in the United Party, we are all about accountability. We want to make sure that you are accountable for you and the actions that you decide to commit, good, bad, or indifferent, but you are accountable for those. So we don't want to have any of this finger pointing. Right. We lay the groundwork, we make the baseline, and then we all agree on the rules to the game. That's it. It's really simple. So, I mean, should we prioritize it? Yes. Should it be involved in our foreign policy? No, it should not. Not in my mind, anyway. Um, if we're going to be doing international and in engagements with other countries, well, it goes back to the same thing. Those are not things that should be put on the internet. We have summits all over the world for this kind of stuff. We have these conversations and if we have complete and total transparency, we put it up on the website. The, the conversations that are had should be publicly available globally if we're doing any kind of international engagement and any person from either side should have access to this documentation so that they can give you their opinion, their agreement or disagreement, whatever it may be, their, your support or your, your non-support. If we create transparency, what is there to steal? There's nothing to hide. Exactly. And, you know, and a lot of, a lot of good folks out there, you know, they, they subscribe to uh, a VPN network just so they can protect their information. Um, and, you know, it, this conversation goes back to education. You know, we were talking about education quite a bit. And I think that there should be something in order for all of the current, you know, adults today, um, as well as for, you know, the, the school children uh, to understand about, um, you know, have some level of cybersecurity uh, training, you know, like so the, you know, some common sense stuff, like, you know, um, you're a lot safer if you're, if you're running everything kind of like analog. So, so to speak, like I buy things with cash. I don't buy them with credit cards, uh, unless I absolutely have to, as one of the last resort emergency, like say I got to get gas or I have to go and stay at a motel or something. <laughs> but it's getting to the point now where uh, cash is, is becoming irrelevant and everything. We've got our national security. We've got uh, the entire banking system. We've got uh, all the retailers now are starting to move more and more towards the digital aspect and less and less towards the actual phys physical cash, which makes it even more harder. Um so I think there needs to be some kind of a, lo a level of education that needs to be uh, taught at an early age, um, and of course, you know, uh, you know, accessible for everybody uh, in our country because we see a lot of older people they get scammed a lot, usually right around the holidays. And, Tax um, time. Yeah, and that's you know, and one of the big things is um, in the past. You know, um, when uh, when I first started doing uh, podcasting or <clears throat> I would talk a lot about, uh, you know, national security or personal security or home security or whatever kind of security, um, you know, that cybersecurity is becoming more prevalent today. It's this a growing market. Uh, there's more and more people are going to school for it, but we don't have uh, a basic approach to how you know somebody like me who say i don't have any knowledge whatsoever i'm elderly how do i 
you know, how do I do this? How do I do that? Without giving my information. Um, and it's almost to the point that you don't even go online at all. But at some point, uh, when I go to the store and I have to buy something with my card because it don't get to cash anymore. Um, everything is digitalized. So all my information is going up. Say, for example, I go to Walmart and I'm, I, I buy a cup of coffee, you know, or or I buy, you know, clothing or something. And I got to use my credit card. Well, there should be some level of education being offered for free so that the citizens can understand, okay, well, if I am going to use my card, there's, there's going to, there's like do's and don'ts, right? So kind of break it down to like, you can do this, but don't do this, right? Uh, that seems to be the concept, uh, understanding anyway, for a lot of, like a lot of my viewers, they, they, they know that, okay, you can do this, but if you don't do this, why? Here's why you don't do this, you know? Uh, and if you are going to do this, here's what the risk, you know? We don't have an educational format for that yet. Um, internet, when it first came out, it was, it was, it was a whole new world. It was a, a, a whole new, like you say, a double-edged sword because there was so much that we didn't know but yet, the bad people out there saw this as an opportunity. And so they've used the internet to exploit so many people. Um, you know, everything, well, <clears throat> we've got a lot of other, other issues too going on. We got uh, the mental health crisis because there's a lot of online bullying going on. Um, I mean, <clears throat> you know, it's almost like uh, in the psychological world, you know, they're, they're trying to coin a name, a term for this, but it's almost as if uh, people develop a bipolar personality or in real, in real life, you know, if you were having a conversation face-to-face, -face, it'd, be, it'd be one thing. But it seems like when people go online, uh, they become this other persona and, you know, uh, <clears throat> people are kind of, you know, still dealing with this. I know the our generation, the older generation were for the most part, we're pretty honest. We're pretty transparent about who we are. And that's because of our upbringing. We didn't grow up with the internet. I mean, we, we basically invented the internet. Uh, so for the younger generation, this, this is, this is a challenge that we've got to find a way to help them overcome because, and, it, and even for, you know, our generation and older, we, we need to have some kind of a format, some way to, say do's and don'ts about, uh, you know, when you're, when you're going online, you know, and, uh, this, these are things that you should do and things you shouldn't do. And, um, and like I tell a lot of my people is, listen, when you, you go online and you do something stupid, just understand that your IP address tracks you right to your house. It's like a GPS signature. And so you want to be very careful about what you're putting out there and, and, and what kind of attention you're attracting to yourself, you know, and uh, there's and there's there's always going to be that bad guy out there that's going to try to take take advantage of the situation. But that kind of leads me to uh, my next question. I wanted to ask you is uh, we're going to be talking about uh, military alliances and defense spending. This has been a hot topic for a lot of my viewers. Uh, we've been talking about this uh, quite often, uh, off and on. But should the U.S. invest heavily? in military alliances and defense capabilities, or should there be a reevaluation of defense spending and international military commitments? Maintaining strong military alliances and investing in defense ensures, you know, global stability, deters aggression and reinforces US leadership on the world stage. However, Excessive defense spending can lead to waste and diminish resources for domestic needs and the US should reassess its global military commitments for sure. And the in the view of the United Party thus far, I think that we collectively think that defense spending should really go down significantly. I mean, it really should go down significantly. And as far as military alliances, we don't even take care of our soldiers at home. And Sorry. we're trying to train soldiers around the globe I, I don't think that the United Party supports that very much. I think that 
we're kind of like the guys in school that are like, yeah, we're cool with everybody, you know, and we can hang out with everybody, but we're not here to protect you. Don't do stupid shit. And you won't have to ask us to come stand beside you and help you fight a fight that we're not involved in. So we've talked about this a little bit briefly, but I really feel like if we take and bring all of our military defense contracting in house, it's going to cut the spending exponentially. I mean, yeah. it's going to cut it down to probably a third to what we spend total. And if we spend more time taking some of our military defense spending and spend it on the people that have already been in the military that are suffering from PTSD and several other issues, you know, physical, mental, housing, you know, we, we have to start taking some of our defense budget and saying, look, it's not about building weapons of war. It's about making sure that the people that are there to use them can come home safely. They don't really need to be used unless absolutely necessary. And that we're not just showing our cards all the time. We're not just teaching everybody how we run our military over here. Mm -hmm. Like, why are we sending all of these men and women over to the Ukraine to train? As soon as the Soviet, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. As soon as Russia figures out that we're doing that over there, and they decide that they're going to, you know, pew pew those guys, then uh, now we got a problem with Russia, right? All right. And we're just over there doing some training that we shouldn't even be doing anyway. Because I, in my mind, I think if the United Party, as it develops, you know, will start providing a, a vision of, you know, minimizing military defense contract or spending because our military is already very strong. We're focused on our nation and we will have um, more people wanting to join because of the benefits of joining. Um, let's not forget about like the lifelong paycheck and all that kind of good stuff, but they'll really get something valuable out of it. They'll learn a lot about themselves. They'll know that when they get done, that we'll be there to take care of them mm -hmm. and that we're not going to be sending them all over the globe to train everybody. We're over there for diplomatic reasons. We're over there in our embassies so that if somebody has some issues seeking asylum or one of our citizens is in a jam and we need to stand up and, you know, do our job, that's what they're there for. So I really think that we're against the, the high defense spending. And, you know, I don't think that we really want to put a whole lot into military alliances because look where it's got us now with the whole Israel and Hamas. Exactly. Look we're, yeah. we're being proxied into everything. We're sending our kids over there that have no stake in the game. Whoever wins or loses that whole ordeal over there is going to have zero impact on us. Zero. Mm -hmm. Either Israel's going to get bigger or it's going to get gone. Right. Right. And, It'll and, get and, 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 you know, when I did the panhandle documentary, one of the things that I found on my research was, is that the military industrial complex. Okay. So in particular, there's a company called Vanguard. Now mm -hmm. Vanguard, I, I'm, I mean, I don't know what Joe Biden's policy was during at the time, but um, Vanguard decided they were going to take their business to China in 2006. And one of the big things they did was they were selling China the very same equipment that they were selling to the U.S. military. And one of the biggest problems I had with that anyway, as an independent, is if we have a, a piece of technology that nobody else has that should be the first primary goal is to protect that technology from falling into the wrong hands and it, it, it's always been that way um up, up until obama anyway and then in, in 2008 they china found out that they were selling it to you know to our u.s military they put they put sanctions on vanguard uh for for doing that but the interesting thing is, is that we have a military industrial complex who uh, is not being held accountable. They don't uh, they don't have an allegiance to any country or any one country. Uh, their allegiance is to the dollar. And 
So I guess as a, what would the United Party's approach be on that issue? So, well, well a couple of things. The, the company you're actually referring to is called AIA. Vanguard is a financial firm. And the topic that you're actually talking about, they made a movie of it called War Dogs. And what it was, was they were moving munitions after we got done with the war over there in Afghanistan. They went and collected all that stuff, and then they sold it to a, a country that was not on our cool to sell to list. Right. So the way that that we would handle things like that again would be all of our all of our technologies, all of our munitions, we would be responsible for. So we would not be leaving billions of dollars of equipment over in another country to be sold off to another country that's not our ally, and we would we would have a much um, more stringent policy on how that equipment gets redistributed or sold to another country based on the age and value of the equipment, mm -hmm. right? Like we're not gonna give them our new technology and just you know pay them a bunch of money to move it because we didn't wanna leave it there because that's what happens. It becomes a bidding war, right? Mm -hmm. You get the military industrial complex. They need some contractors to come in and move some stuff because our military legally cannot do anything um, because we've, you know, disengaged the war's over, blah, 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 whatever the case may be. So now this isn't really my area of expertise, but I would probably say when it comes to a situation like that, we would again have to hold them accountable on uh, a multi-nation platform, right? So if it's causing a beef between the United States and China, then it would be up, it would be up to the leadership in the United States and China to figure out how are they going to mitigate this from happening again? What is going to be the prosecution process and who's going to take what role and responsibility in each part? I like that. I like that. Because again, we're trying to get along, right? We're trying right. to get along. Exactly. So and one thing about military defense contracting companies like you know, Boeing and, and Raytheon, they have locations all over the globe and they do private contracts for other countries that we may get along with today, but maybe not tomorrow. And those contracts aren't going to stop, right? Because they actually have a business in Europe or, you know, whatever country, pick one, Afghanistan, Iran, they have facilities there where they have researchers working on technologies because Raytheon is a name. It's a research and development company that does military defense contracting across the board for the military industrial complex. And, right. you know, that's where we need to define the rules of how that's going to operate within the United States. We can't tell them what to do in another country. But what we can do is say, if you are going to have a division of, just as an example, Raytheon, which I mean, I like those guys. I mean, I worked for them for a long time. They're a great place to work for but you cannot have any communications outside these borders period if you're within the united states you have a headquarters here you do all your business here and none of your computer systems none of your infrastructure none of your communications ever leave this country now what you're going to wind up seeing is a bunch of crybabies well that's not fair because they can't they can't get the global grab right right tough shit go over there and, and start up you know raytheon tube same thing that america is doing to tiktok right yep. tiktok's owned by a chinese company but their american division is 100 separated there is no data communications between the two of them so they say yeah and you know that that's the boundaries that they need to start setting on anybody who's into military defense contracting just to mitigate any of these kind of things happening not only is it very dangerous but it could inadvertently trigger a war between two nations that were cool for a while and then this happened because in that particular story you're talking about they had to move all those munitions against an enemy's territory and get mm -hmm. it to the guys that they were trying to supply it to yep so we yep. don't want to be we don't want to be involved in that because that's where some of our problems really begin right is we say Oh, yeah, yeah, no, we got you. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. But when it comes down to the brass tax, somebody's got to pay. And because there's no transparency, they can 
basically undermine whomever they want and hold whoever they want accountable to be the fall guy. And that individual company or nation has no idea it's even coming. But when you got things like NATO, you've got however many countries saying, nope, this is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to suffer. And this is what your consequences are. And the poor country had nothing to do with it. So we got to be very, very careful about allowing any of that stuff to be moved amongst the globe or around the globe. It's got to be something that is in our country, our country only. And I'll tell you what, if you get caught doing some dumb shit, you know where you're going to wind up, right? Yep. That ditch ain't done. It ain't going to dig itself. <laughs> right. Well, and that's the thing too, you know, NATO was expressly, well, okay. So the, the original concept of NATO and what was agreed upon with NATO was the reason why they had NATO was to combat um, communism, and yeah. spe especially uh, specifically in Russia. Now, part of that agreement and the terms of that agreement was is once communism didn't exist anymore, especially in Russia, that the NATO itself was supposed to dissolve. And instead, what had happened was they went the opposite direction. And they started including more and more nations. Now, at the time, Russia, uh, under uh, Vladimir Putin, <clears throat> Vladimir had actually expressed and said, "Well, we'd like to, uh, we'd like to participate uh, in NATO, be a part of NATO, be be part of the alliance, be part of you know, uh, we'd like to take bring our munitions to certain places, and we can put them there, and it could be a part of NATO uh, strength, you know." And basically, NATO turned around and gave the middle finger, um, and said, "No, we're, we we don't want you. We don't we don't want you to be a part of this." You know, and so that's what's that's been the root cause of the Russian and Ukraine conflict. Um, and this goes back to what you're saying: is a partnership is easier because uh, you know the terms can change very quickly. Yeah rather than trying to have some kind of an alliance because this is and if, if from, from the understanding of in the webster dictionary what alliances mean is usually oftentimes when alliances are formed is during the time of war so we went from you know uh world war one world war two we had the axis we had the uh, the uh the the evil and then we had um and then we had the Cold War with Russia. Now, once Russia dissolved and became a federation, uh, much like the United States, they have a constitution. They <laughs> they didn't want anything to do with communism, and they expressed their interest in wanting trying to have some kind of a partnership with the U.S. But uh, they decided that wasn't in the best interest of their national security. But I, you know, I beg to differ on that. <laughs> that line of thought that our leaders had because normally if you want to achieve world peace you want to do it through diplomacy you want it to through um you know economic ties you know you want to do it through all these things but every everything that they you know, our leaders have done has been detrimental in the long term in the long run and uh you know i agree with you 100 percent about uh, getting rid of NATO, getting, getting rid of the UN, um, or at least uh, redefining some things within the UN. So this allows a partnership between all of the nations of the world, not just a select few, but yes. allow that platform for everybody to come. They can send that one guy from that one country come and he can say, well, we're having an issue with, say, Cuba because they're placing economic sanctions on us and we're we don't want to go to war. We want to be able to, to sell our items to Cuba. But for whatever reason, Cuba decides, you know, hey, um, we're going to uh, place tariffs on you because we don't like the way you're conducting business in your own country with your own citizens. Um, and this is where, you know, if everybody just gets on the same, on the same, you know, uh, same understanding is that you know, you run your country the way you want to run it. Um, it's not our business to tell you what to do. And it's not your business to tell us what to do and how we should run our country. 
<clears throat> but we could benefit, well, all of us can benefit if we, uh, you know, we set up some kind of economic trade where we can have a peaceful a resolution where, you know, everybody is, you know, on the same page. And, uh, you know, they should resolve the differences within the UN first before uh, they start placing sanctions, right? So that's that's always been kind of my approach is, you know, it, like, for example, <laughs> we see this a lot on TikTok. So if somebody says something that I don't agree with, I will go to them in their DMs and I will say, hey, you know, I think you had some some interesting ideas, but um, I'd like to offer a different, you know, a, 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 a view on this or I'd like to offer a remedy to this or, you know, but what happens is, is people will just take to the Internet and all of a sudden they start putting stuff out saying bad things about this person and creating this conflict, you know, and almost like a clickbait type situation with no intent to resolve the situation to begin with. Um, and I think if we, if we as a nation get back to the idea of the premise of, well, you know, if the United States is having problems with Russia, I think that's a great idea that our president, you know, if you became the president of the United States, is to pick up the phone and call, say, Vladimir Putin if he's still the president. And say, hey, you know, we had a we had a situation, and one of our rockets, you know, uh, just fucking went a wall. We had no control over it. Uh, it landed in, in you know, a lo- a, on the other side of your border, and we screwed up. You know, taking that acknowledgement, say, hey, we screwed up. So <clears throat> instead of you know declaring war or whatever, how about this? Uh, we will come, uh, we will send you the money. If anything, we'll send you the money to pay for whatever damages, right? Uh, it's kind of like a one-time thing, but maybe in a sense, maybe we can do some other things too to help kind of fix it, you know, to to make amends to that situation, right? Have some kind of diplomacy in place. But it seems like the people we are electing to represent us on the world stage has been, always been consistently, um, you know, deny, 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 and then deflect and then blame the very person or the very country they got, they got injured from, from whatever type of actions. Um, but this brings me to my last question I have for you today. Um, and we're going to be talking about is global leadership um, and exceptionalism. So should the U.S. embrace in its role as a global leader and advocate for international norms, or should it adopt a more restrained approach and respect the other nation's sovereignty? Well, let me go back to the last question real quick because I, I just I just wanted to prove or, or just wanted to voice my opinion a little bit on that. This is all under the thought that world peace is a reality, and it's not. Like that's something that the world has to come to terms with. There will never be world peace. There just won't. That's like trying to assume that every person on the planet is a good person. And that's just not the truth. So we have to understand that. Secondly, the idea that we could get along on that type of level is going to take so much unraveling of the last 50 years, 60 years of lies and deceit that it's almost best to wipe the slate clean and start promoting transparency amongst the nations within their own nations. And again, it's not our business. The UN will, will quickly evolve into the World Economic Forum if we were to put something together like that, because what happens with human beings is they group into clubs and cliques. We see it all over the world and it's always been that way and it always will be that way. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that's the greatest solution. In my mind, I think we should have four UN type, you know, communities and each of the four should have representation that go to, you know, uh, a hangout 
if things get to the point where like we need to have some discussions. But otherwise, I think it's really important that we keep things separated so that we don't lose culture because people are always going to feel like they're being undermined. They're always going to feel like they're not being heard. So the smaller the groups, the better we're going to get uh, output from them. If we have a large group of people, it's going to be a lot of arguments and a lot of disagreements. And then it comes back to war, right? Like, why are we fighting right now in, in Gaza and Israel? What is their big beef? Because I can tell you right now, it's probably not between like the Israeli citizens and the citizens of Gaza. It's probably between two of the leaders that have a, a complaint with one another and they're just using their people out there to show their force. And yeah. we want to really move away from that. At least the United Party that I dream of does not support that kind of rhetoric. Um, it's it's not constructive. It's um, very problematic. And once you fester a problem, it just grows and grows and grows. And at the end of the day, we're talking about a country that's been at war for 2000 years with the nation next to it, right? So trying to step in and change that is not really going to happen. We're never going to determine who the owner of the Holy Land is. We're just not. It's not our fight. So my whole thing is we first need to make people understand that there's no such thing as world peace. There will always be conflict because you cannot have good without bad. Right. But well, just like I said before, the other podcast is from a biblical perspective. The Bible tells us that history tends to repeat itself often. And the reason being is because, number one, as generations come and go, the future generations oftentimes forget about uh, what the past generations have done. Or we have elected officials who do understand the past generations and have controlled the education side of things so that they could create more conflicts. So there's always going to be there's always going to be conflicts. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, if even if we were to find a way to achieve world peace, <clears throat> oftentimes it's very short lived. We'll take a look at Donald Trump, for example. So <laughs> in his presidency, if we had four years of world peace, no conflicts, no new wars. Um, but the problem was is that as soon as they elected. Uh, Joe Biden into, into office, and now we have three new wars, right? We have three com major conflicts, and our resources are, are being, we're hemorrhaging so much resources on a daily basis. It's not getting us anywhere. And so if Trump come, you know, now that Trump has won his election uh, for 2024, <laughs> once he gets into office and he does achieve that world peace again, uh, you know, people need to understand that We may have uh, just we may we may end up in the position where we're only going to have this world peace for four years. We're not going to have a lasting peace, you know, and that's a uh, that's a kind of a a fallacy, uh, a foolhardy uh, approach, I guess. That's the best way to put it. And uh, we, you know, the only way, I guess. <laughs> I mean, we go back and we look at history. We we know, without without a doubt, with certainty, that there has never been a lasting world peace. That is because, as generations come and go, people often forget about what's the most important thing, and people get greedy. It's just it's just a lot of human nature that goes in that's involved in a lot of these things, and 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 right now, you know, it's. I mean, the greed has been, greed has always been the problem. Greed, I mean, it's, it's going to, you know, the situation is, is we're always going to go back and forth. We're always going to have war. We're going to have peace for a while. Then we're going to have war again. It's just going to be, that's just a part of life. That's just, you know, uh, that's unfortunate, but, um, Other, you know, economists will say, well, we got to have war in order to, um, you know, get rid of an old system to replace it with a new system and out of chaos, we can bring order, you know, um, whatever, whatever, you know, euphemism or rhetoric that they want to use. But when it comes down to it is 
is that I know that the, the vast majority of Americans today, uh, we do want to see world peace. We do, uh, we know it's not going to last, but but it's it's just, it's a nice thought to have to have that. You know, uh, whether it's through diplomacy or whether it's through economic uh, partnerships, um, and that's what we're kind of hoping for. But I do agree with you. You know, we uh, world peace. It doesn't. It just doesn't last. Um, and you know things change as time goes on. So, um, but back to my question about the global leadership and, and uh, exceptionalism. Um, I'll, I'll ask the question again. Uh, should the U.S. Em embrace in its role as a global leader and advocate for more international norms, or should it just adopt a more restrained approach and respect other nations' sovereignty? The U.S. has a unique role and responsibility as a global leader to shape international norms, and that's without a doubt. They've always looked to us to help out. Um, if we do not side with them, they either put up or shut up, you know. So, you know, we can advocate for democratic values and address global challenges, but we cannot make them our responsibility. Yeah. So, you know, American exceptionalism can lead to unilateral actions and, and complete disregard for other countries, their perspectives, potentially in international relations. So, you know, when we start saying that we're gonna step in, well, we're, we're actually creating more problems, right? Because we're, we're stepping in with American values and we're not taking into consideration the, the values of those nations. Mm -hmm. So in, in my opinion, I would think that the United Party would probably, and we'll find out more about this as we start gathering more and more, you know, patrons and getting their opinions on it. And I'm sure that there will have some, you know, pretty wild ideas, but all those ideas are what's going to be the foundation of the party. And I think the most important thing is that we respect other nations and we ex we respect their sovereignty. You know, if, if they choose to be a form of government that we do not believe in, then we need to find out their their values and what their communities are like, what their education is like, what their culture is like, instead of trying to play this humanitarian role like we know it's best for everybody. And that's the problem with humanitarianism is yeah. those guys fight amongst themselves more than anybody because mm -hmm. they're all trying to tell you what the best humanitarian way to be is. But if you look at some of these people, some of these people aren't even really very nice people. You know, and unfortunately, I have a friend of mine who said some really nasty things about me because Trump won the election. And, uh, you know, and I'll be the first one to tell you, I, I went right to my Facebook and I said, you know, what's funny. It's, uh, you know, all these folks that were sitting here saying as soon as he's, you know, wins the election, you know, we're moving out. And I said, well, let me help you out with that. And I put a link for kayak, you know, travel <laughs> website. <laughs> and she wrote me this nasty thing, call me all these terrible things. And I was like, you know, for somebody who's a Democrat and she's got her master's in, uh, you know, psychology and all this other great stuff. And and all she could do was say terrible things about how, you know, the new administration was going to destroy the American culture. But as I really thought about it, I was like, this is coming from somebody who lives in a bubble. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I don't think that people would know what world peace was or if it was necessary if we didn't tell them. Right. Because you, know, you live in your community. If you're happy in your community, is that not world peace? I mean, in right. your world, it is, right? Yeah. So I think, you know, if, if people stop trying to be so humanitarian about everything and make everything equal then I think a lot of that stuff would start to fall off. And I think it's really important that if we are going to provide any type of global leadership, that we do it with respect to the other nation's culture. And we can yeah. only show you what has worked for us and we can show you what hasn't worked for us. And then from there, you can make your own determination on what you feel like you should cherry pick from the good and put back from the bad. You know, it's that simple. If you can recognize through our mistakes, what's coming your way, that's wonderful. 
You've mm -hmm. got insight now. But if you want to be a country that's just going to go around telling everybody the way they should be, you're going to create far more conflict than peace ever. Right. It's kind of like, it would be kind of like us going to the Amish and saying, you guys need to have electricity. You need to have indoor plumbing. You need to have um, house insurance. You need to, uh, you know, we can tell you, well, you can only have uh, one barn. Um, you can only have a uh, hundred cows, not 5,000 cows. Or uh, if you're going to plow your field, you got to buy John Deere tractor, you know, um, you know, and the Amish, they're not going to take too kindly to that, you know, because, you know, that's the thing about culture. Oftentimes culture, they, they sort of take on a, I'm, I'm not a big evolutionary type of guy, but, um, but they do evolve. I mean, cultures do evolve. They do expand. Uh, but sometimes some cultures, they go back to some of the older cultures because they, you know, they say, well, this is more sustainable because if we do homesteading, we can grow our own food and we can store our own food. We can do all these things. That's going to save us money in the long run. But yes, is it more effort? Yes, it's not. It's, we don't have that convenience as much, but it's it's a healthier way of living. Right. Compared to, say, somebody in the city, you know, um, who uh conveniences for them is a necessity because they don't have that a luxury or that ability to maybe or physically to be able to uh say you know uh grow all of their food you know say say two three acres of land they can't just you know jump up and just grow their own food so making that food available to them and at that convenience is a necessity because you know they might be working in the business office and so they're working 12 hours a day you know <laughs> so when it comes to culture you know it's always there's always been a clash between cultures like i had like for example uh, i grew up on a farm and and then uh, later on in life i you know traveled quite a bit uh, worked in offices uh you know uh, been assigned uh, post duties uh, to different places around the world. And when people find out that, you know, I used to be, you know, I used to grow up on a farm, they're kind of like, oh, so you're a redneck. And it's like right away, here we go. We got these labels, you know. And they've been, and every time somebody just starts slapping that label, instead of actually trying to understand my ethics or how I was raised, and people just, tend to go to that labeling real quick and my big thing is is that i've worked with so many diverse different cultures from, from around the world and it's always fascinating to see you know um like for example in saudi arabia every uh, you know because of their muslim religion you know, every morning and, and and noon and night you know they've got big uh, like a church bell but they do this like chanting and prayer and everybody stops and they don't put out their mats and they face the east or face the west or whatever and the music is beautiful you know i take up i have kind of taken appreciation to no matter what culture it is because to me this is this is their country this is you know their way of doing things right even if they're living here in america okay so this is you know um these are what you're, you know, if I don't have, if I don't understand what their values are, my first thing is I'm going to ask them, what is your value? Right. And I think the approach and the attitude of having a, a, a united country is when you travel to different places, <clears throat> like, for example, if I go to, uh, well, let's say Louisiana. Now, Louisiana has its own culture. They've had their own culture for the last 200 and some years. <laughs> Used to be known as the French Quarter. They, and they've, they've held on to a lot of traditions. And so when I go down there, I can't go with the expectation of telling them that they need to change and to be more like me just, as, just so I'd fit in. Instead, I have the attitude that when I go down there and I'm meeting people down there for the first time, some of these people are, st are still speaking French. So I will take it upon myself and I'll download the, the, the Babylon app or whatever. 
and I'll try to learn some French. So when I get down there, uh, I understand what they're saying. And maybe I'll do some Wikipedia research on, you know, the French quarters and try to get an idea of what it is life is like for them. But you don't really know it until you get down there and you go through that experience. It just, just by asking, you know, questions, it brings me to a closer understanding of who, you know, that particular culture and why these, uh, you know, these people live a certain way. And it gives me a greater appreciation because, you know, for my country here, uh, or I should say our country, <laughs> you know, we want to, we want to be able to go places, you know, we want to be able to cross uh, state lines and go to different states uh, and, and learn something different and, and, and embrace that culture. It does not necessarily mean that I'm going to change my culture. It just means that it gives me a greater understanding of that culture. So I know how to interact without you know causing a lot of commotion i guess that's the best that's the best response um so like if i go to figure a good example is like if i go to germany so i'm going to do all my research on germany first and i'm going to do my research on the towns or the cities i'm going to go to and they have a ton of useful information but once when you take that trip and go there say i'm going to go there for the Oktoberfest, right and my goal is to eat as many bratwurst uh, and drink it, you know, a ton of beer or whatever. But once I get there, and they, in their culture, you know, if they have, they have a certain way of doing things, especially if you're an outsider coming in, um, you know, they'll pander to you, you know, they'll give you, um, they'll sell you some outfits or whatever, but you can't actually participate in like certain dances, right? So, and that's something that you learn by just being there, by going there and being there. Um, and I think, you know, with, <laughs> with what has transpired in the last four years is there's been less people traveling and less people understanding of each other's cultures especially here in america we've got we've been we've, we've been fitted uh it's, it's, this is amazing how the internet can be used for good but can also be used for the most evil things uh we got people on the democrat side we got republicans we've got independents we've got all these other parties and it almost seems like nobody can get along why because there's people who don't understand or not willing to take the time to understand what is your values and, and instead what's happened is we've had this the left side of things being consistently shoved down everybody's throats and that's what's caused so much hostility so this goes very long right along with what you were saying is by respecting other nations' sovereignty, instead of trying to tell them, you know, if you've got a problem with somebody else, um, you know, do it the American way. <laughs> what, we, what we should be doing is, okay, I'm going to take a trip to, uh, let's say, Yugoslavia and and uh, the country of Georgia. They're having some problems. So I'm going to go to Yugoslavia. I'm going to go there as, as a tourist. I'm going to go and try to learn their values and their habits and you know uh, algorithm type stuff right so I'm going to collect a lot of information and process it and say, oh okay what are some similarities uh that i have with them right then i go to you uh, then i go to georgia i do the same thing and then what you're going to find out is I, I kind of focus on this, like, hey, there are similarities between Georgia and Yugoslavia. And then if they want, say, like me to mediate the situation, then what I'm going to be doing is, is focusing on the similarities between those two countries to help them bring about some kind of a peaceful resolution. 
instead of coming in there saying, hey, this is the American way of doing things. You're going to do this, you're going to do that, and blah, 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 blah. And this has never, this has not worked well for for anybody. Uh, and they've been doing this for the last, you know, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years. Yeah. Isn't this exactly how the whole humanitarian movement started by exa exactly by what you just said? Yep. You're a third party. You don't even belong there. You're not part of either culture. You're just trying to go in there and learn them so that you can be the mediator, which is not your job, role, or responsibility. There needs to be mediation by their leadership. We should not have anything to do with any of that because you know what? You're not going to learn their culture in a month. Exactly. It's like what it's like when we went to Motogoshu, right? And UNICEF and UNICEF and the UN and a few other agencies were involved, but they would go when they do food drop offs without even trying to come to understand Motogoshu, the culture, the people, you know, how, how things are there. And the one thing they, they, they kind of did was they put this embargo on them. And they say, well, we don't like it, the fact that you guys are not taking care of your people the way we think you should. And by the way, y'all got too many guns. Uh, you need to get rid of that shit. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, we ain't going to bring you food. But we still brought them food anyway. We did a big, big food drop off. And the warlords came in and they basically confiscated the food because why? We Here's the whole time we were thinking... Oh, yeah, it's because they want their people to starve. No, it's because they knew our food was poisonous. They were trying to protect <laughs> people from eating poisonous food. And so they, you know, the media jumped on it. And, of course, the media is being all controlled. And they, what were they telling us? Oh, they're, oh, they're trying to keep the, you know, they're trying to starve their people, basically. <clears throat> what in reality is, is that the food was fucking poisonous to begin with. They were trying to protect their own people. And... You know, we come in and we're we're trying to do brute force and all this shit, and it's never solved anything. It's never does. One conflict after the next, just keeps keeps roving, it keeps changing, and just you know, oh my gosh, <laughs> and it, it's it's almost like I want to say this. This this phrase has been kind of thrown around since 1776. It's always been the nation of the people. Uh, it's always been the will of the people who have built this country off the backs of those who do the hard manual labor. We, you know, those are the people that build the country. But if you want to destroy a country, just throw a bunch of suits in there, get them elected, and what do you got? A shit get, show. A shit show, exactly. And unfortunately, we've had a lot of, I want to say this, we've had a lot of uh, very greedy, greedy politicians. We have career politicians who go into politics. And it's not for the will of the people, but it's to serve themselves and to serve their, you know, whatever their little club, you know, the best interest of their club. Yeah, what is the best interest of the club? It's always been about money. You know, oh, as well, how can we make money off of by creating this kind of a conflict? Well, let's go to BlackRock. Let's go to Vanguard. Uh, well, you know, BlackRock has the very first AI computer that was ever created in 1990. Or I should say 1989. But it went, out, it went online in 1990. And this thing is just pumping out, oh, we can create this kind of a conflict. You can create this kind of conflict. This is how much in revenue stream that you'll get from this conflict. This is how much in revenue stream you're going to get from uh, the back end of it, right? <laughs> and they've had this 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 ungodly hold on our politicians, and our politicians are very weak people, very 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 weak, weak weak ass people who can't even stand up to the machine and say, you know what? Nope. No, oh, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to participate. Uh, we want to achieve this world peace, you know. But we're going to do this the way. We're going to, 
uh, focus on, you know, our own sovereignty, take care of our own problems first. And, you know, if those countries want to, you know, whatever, let them solve their own problems. But, you know, if they decide to come here and, and mess with us, then they can pluck around and find out. But <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> so either way, you know, I think, I mean, I really do love the approach that that you're taking uh that you're thank you doing. i mean it's it's just it just really makes sense it's it's almost um it's it's <laughs> i have to say it's pretty pretty ironic because if you think about this we go back to world war one the united states did not want to get involved in world war one and we've had a lot of independence during that time saying <clears throat> what's what what kind of a burden are we going to place on on our own people but the economically, right? Right. Uh, you know, how is this going to impact our, our people? And then Woodrow Wilson says, well, we're going to kind of hold off, you know. He knew, and of course, he knew the, the, the international waters were being heavily patrolled. And so he sends the Carpathia out there, and we've got 15 soldiers. Now, we only got only 15 soldiers aboard Carpathia, but Carpathia, knowing that if they're going to go through the waters to deliver supplies to England or whatever, uh, they were eventually going to get attacked. And they did. And they sunk the ship. And all of a sudden, Woodrow also says, okay, we're going to war. And the thing is, is that they were not anticipating on our soldiers coming home. Okay. They were not anticipating. So what they did was they lied to the American people and said, listen, <laughs> if you sign up with the Army or the Marines or the Navy, and then if you go and fight for us, and when you come home, uh, you're guaranteed $100 a month. You're guaranteed uh, assistance with medical. You're guaranteed all these benefits. So all these men decided, okay, we're, we're let's go do this. You know, we're, let's go fight for our country. They're not really fighting. For, and the thing is, the premise is, is they were sold a lie to begin with. They're not really fighting for the United States. They were fighting to liberate uh, England from whatever conflicts and problems they had over there. So the end of World War One happens. Soldiers come home, and, and we're talking well over a million, and all of a sudden they find out Woodrow Wilson was not going to give them the hundred dollars a month. They weren't going to give them any medical care, none of this stuff. So what do they do? They marched to Washington. They protested. Uh, he calls the national guard in to, to try to drive them out. And what did our veterans do? They burnt down half of Washington DC in protest. Right. And then <laughs> you know, a couple years later, you know, um, they started to get into the whole expansion. They started, you know, trying to figure out a way to, we were going through a Great Depression, we went through Dust Bowl, and then they said, okay, let's send our veterans down to Louisiana, uh, you know, to build the docks and, you know, the uh, seaport infrastructure. And knowing at that time there was going to be a hurricane, knowing that when you're down there and you're building these docks and hurricanes coming, there's <laughs> you have no way to get out, right? You have really have no way to get out. You have no way to uh, get yourself into a safe space, a safe place to protect yourself. And so they, you know, inadvertently ended up killing quite a few veterans in the process. All so they can get out of having to pay and take care of them. This has been an ongoing problem for, you know, again, since World War One, And it's, it's just... Uh, it's interesting because, you know, when we talk about taking care of the American people, you know, as an independent, I've always believed that we need to take care of our people first, first and foremost. Yeah. 100%. I mean, if, I, if, if, I, if, if I'm going down to the grocery store to buy a loaf of bread and I have to stop for a, for a minute and think about uh, what's the most important thing right now. Can I afford to buy a $9 piece of loaf of bread or should I invest that $9 into trying to pay off my electric bill? If I don't pay my entire electric bill off in time, 
they're going to shut me off. So I've got to decide bread or electricity. Okay. If we get to that point, there should be no reason, and I mean absolutely no reason, why we should be engaged in any kind of conflict or even engaged in trying to help resolve any conflict uh, because, number one, we don't have uh, our politicians that we have in office. They obviously don't care about the American people, number one, um, especially in the last four years. We have veterans sleeping on streets. Um, just recently, yesterday, I found out that um, during uh, during Halloween is one of the most prolific and dangerous times for veterans who are, who are living on the streets because a lot of the human traffickers will go around and start scooping up veterans off the street during Halloween. Um, but, but that's a, but that's a, we get into that for another uh, topic another time. But uh, the point is, is that we have the, the people who, you know, <clears throat> who took a piece of paper, the, the oath that they're going to volunteer to go to basic, basic training or boot camp or whatever, and they're going to get taught everything that is they need to know. And they're just going to sign their name on that dotted line. And at the end of the day, this is a contractual agreement between the U.S. government and that individual. But oftentimes, if we find out this contractual agreement is nothing more than a piece of paper with a six-year-old with a crayon scribbling on it, because we've got veterans who, we have so many veterans that are not being taken care of. And... In my opinion, I think we just need to we need to take care of them first. When a veteran can live in prosperity, then we can go back to the table and say, "Hey, um, what can we do to help you guys resolve your conflict over there?" You know, we don't want to start a war. We don't want to. We don't want to create any problems. Uh, you know, tell me a little bit about your culture educate me i want to know everything there is to know about who you are as people so that we can help you guys you know but listen we're not going to do it the american way we're going to do it <laughs> your way and your way well, how, how do you guys do this how do you do this okay let's find the similarities oh so you guys like eating pizza oh you like pizza too i got an idea how about this? You sell your pieces to these people, and these people sell your pieces to those people. Or how about this? Just don't sell any, don't sell shit to any to, to each other at all. You just do you, and you do you, and let's just leave it at that. Yep, yep. Unfortunately, it always boils down to resources. Yeah, but I think and, and that. Uh, go ahead. Well, just like uh, right now, lithium is a new gold rush. And to my viewers out there, you're listening. I want to tell you this. The most dangerous thing that you can have in your house besides nuclear uranium is going to be lithium. You do not want to be around any kind of lithium. I don't care if it's in your car. I don't care if it's in your house. I don't care if it's in a big, giant electrical factory. Those lithium batteries are the most, the second most dangerous type of mater material in the world. Uh, if it's not under control conditions, you're going to, uh, and people, and people make mistakes. People do stupid stuff. Um, and lithium is just not one of those stable compounds. It just really isn't. But for some whatever reason, we got to get into this whole electric car bullshit. Everybody's going to have this electric car. Oh, this Tesla's so cool. Or that this Ford Eco car is awesome, you know. <clears throat> you know, fat, uh, fads aside, uh, we need to understand that you know what's the most important thing: the resources. It should always be the people, not what you can dig up from the ground, and and, and the fact that it doesn't replace itself and creating dangerous conditions. People should be the number one resources that you should protect at all times but unfortunately 
you know, again, we go back to the whole issue of world peace, which is pretty much a, a false, uh, a lasting world peace is a false ideology. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't, it's, it's kind of like this. <clears throat> if everybody was fighting over the exact same material that you saved like a match, you would like that match once. When that match burns out, it's no good. So what do you do? You go, you go back, and you're, you're trying to find the same materials again. But now you got to fight with somebody else over those materials. I'm all for the whole electric stuff, but yeah, when it comes down to it, is it's this: the the electricity portion of life should not be a dominating factor. However, for as far as uh, like infrastructure. Um, critical infrastructure, I would say yes. There's other things that we can use. You know, we could use water, we could use wind, we could use a lot of different things. But we just need to come up with better ways rather than just going out there and, and starting a new war with, say, I don't know, say it was Russia. Because Africa's got the second largest uh, lithium deposit in the world. So, And Russia wants in on it. But so does the U.S. Instead of coming to some kind of a compromise, yeah, we got to go to war, you know. So again, this is the same thing with oil, you know. Same thing with a lot of other stuff. It's just always resources, man. Always. Yeah. It just it's, it's detrimental to put it as. Without a doubt. You know, a crypto, crypto is a new thing now. And I, I've heard so many people talk to me about crypto. And I'm like, you know, it, it's all good and dandy. It's all good and dandy. But if I ain't got it in my hand, it doesn't exist. I'm sorry. I'm just, uh, I'm just that kind of guy. But I say, hey, you know what? If you guys, if you guys make a half a million dollars in two days, it's because... The system is fucking rigged as hell. Uh, so, you know, it, you know, all these people mining it and making money, great. But uh, at the end of the day, it wouldn't take much for, say, a hacker or a pirate, as you call it, could could run a a coded program that basically does what they call the fire sale. And what it does is it entirely shuts down the entire internet infrastructure just with a click of a button. Or uh, another country decides, well, <clears throat> they're, you know, you're, 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 you're basically raping our, our finances. And our country is going so broke because of all this. So we're going to put an end to this. And they decide to send an ICBM, a tactical nuclear warhead above America and detonate it. That would completely fry out all of the components, um, infrastructure wise. How are you going to be able to get access to that crypto to go down to the grocery store to buy that nine dollar loaf of bread? <laughs> well, that's a good question, but I don't, uh, I don't think that uh, that's a feasible solution for them anyway. Mostly because the whole idea behind crypto is it's on a, a distributed infrastructure, right? So it's on every device. And with that, anybody who wanted to write a polymorphic virus to shut down the internet would be shutting themselves down as well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how... You know, my my grandfather always told me this. He said, he always kept telling me, he said, get your head out of the clouds, you know, plant your feet on the ground. He says, that's the kind of man you want to be. And now we've got this generation of people with their heads in the clouds <laughs> yeah. coming, up, <laughs> coming up with imaginary money. And it's like, holy crap. It's like, I have so many DMs on social media. You know, hey, did you get your... Uh, Oh, you geez. know, digital Are wallet. Are you ready for the collapse? <laughs> you know, did you know about crypto? Yeah. And it's like. I hope you're set. Yeah. Oh, oh well, 
if you don't get this crypto, you know, you're, you're not going to have money and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, you know what? If the incoming president, Donald Trump, decides to change our monetary system to crypto, he's going to make it so that all the banks are set up on the crypto system. And I'm still going to be able to go down to the bank and pull out cash to go pay for stuff in cash. You know, it's, it's just this fallacy, this idea that they have to push like crypto is such a... Th- it's such a big fucking hype. And I, I'm, I would not be too surprised in say 10, 20 years from now, crypto doesn't even exist. It becomes a thing of the past and people start going back to, you know, having that piece of gold in their hand or. No, man. No. Sorry. Or... <laughs> We're not going back there because you know what? The other thing you got to take into consideration and is that, you know, with everything running into this whole virtual reality thing, where you know you've already got the goggles out there and you're starting to see them you know re- if they weren't so bulky they would take off a whole lot faster but the point being is that when you're inside this virtual world you have to have a way to buy and sell things right and that's the whole premise of crypto right is that you know you'll be able to do it in the virtual world where you're virtually walking into a bank and virtually getting virtual cash i guess you know but it's all make believe you know that's the problem right it's yeah. all make believe but as long as people keep putting value into it it will have value but when something when you have a lot of something and it has no value then it it provides no solution so well, see, here's the problem with the virtual world is, see, there's a lot of them <laughs> yeah it, when it comes down to the side of security there are so many security flaws like number one we like and i'm sure a lot of people can can agree on this but how many people have been scammed over the internet there's been um, so many different ways you can scam somebody over the internet but at the same time we've got corporations we've got governments that are it's essentially like you said they're they're stealing data they're stealing that fingerprint right so at some point they're going to figure out how to do the exact same thing with crypto at some point you know there yeah. some some nine-year-old kid right now is learning how to code he's going to figure <laughs> he's going to figure this shit out okay it's probably my daughter well so, you know here's the other thing though if you relate this back to because this this is something that has happened over and over again you remember when you used to have door-to-door uh insurance salesmen mm-hmm and you'd be in the middle of Iowa and they'd be selling you hurricane insurance. I'm telling you, you <laughs> never know, you know, or volcano insurance. So the whole scamming of people is something that has gone on for ever. It's going to continue to go that way, but everything will always go back to education. You're never going to have all good people, but if you educate, educate people the best that you can to give them the tools to protect themselves, it, it'll never go away, but we'll see a lot less of it. And yeah. it won't be on such a large scale. You know what I mean? Like right now, everything's on a large scale. And, you know, I, the amount of cryptocurrency that's available in the world right now does not have enough resource value on the planet to support it if you wanted to cash it all in. Right. Exactly. And, and uh, that's that's where we get into, you know, the, finan- uh, the financial economic side of things is... <clears throat> Every nation knows this, that you can run a Ponzi scheme. Let's say you back your, like we back the U.S. dollar with, with oil, right? The petrol. Okay. The petrol, right? Okay, so the, pe- the scam was is that Rockefeller told everybody that oil is very scarce. So that drove up the prices. Of course. When, when in reality, oil was self-replenishing. So, you know, the petrol dollar is, is, is essentially is coming to an end. But when they get done running whatever Ponzi scheme, you know, whatever, you know, hurricane insurance, insurance salesman in the middle of Iowa type situation, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, uh, they, they always end up going back to gold. They end up back in their dollar with gold because gold has been the one consistent belief that has uh, a lot of value it always holds value you never 
it, it loses some value, but it never goes out of style. It's just something that has been around for thousands and thousands of years. But, uh, I mean, everything else comes and goes. The number of people, the population can dwindle, then, then reinvigorate itself again. Uh, but it's just like with crypto, you know, it's, you know, people are going to start to come to the realization that it's not as hot as they think it is, but at some point our country is going to end up backing our, our, our dollars with gold. Now they may use crypto as a means of the measures of the way they tr do transactions, but, um, but there's always going to be, you know, safety and security concerns. Uh, with a lot of that stuff and, and you're right it, it all falls back to boils down to is education people need to educate themselves as yeah. much as they can because at the end of the day you know like for example like myself i just don't feel i don't feel comfortable with having my info well, with my social security number being online or all of that stuff so i don't like the idea of putting my money it's kind of like this you remember that? Remember when that 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 uh, that Ponzi scheme where you get that letter in the mail and it says if you send a dollar <laughs> uh, to like 150 people, and then you 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 kind of join this like dollar pyramid scheme, and the idea is that you would get back like say 325 dollars or something like this. So you put out 150 bucks, a one dollar bill, 150 whatever. And you print out the same exact letter and then you know all this money comes back to you but in reality is is that <laughs> that is it, it doesn't work it, it's just a, a ponzi scheme and i know for like a lot of older people they're frustrated because the way the economy is running having to decide whether i pay my electric bill or i buy a loaf of bread you know yeah and, i think we're all in that spot yeah and you're always gonna you're always going to run into so many different Ponzi schemes running on so many levels. <laughs> and so somebody like me, you know, I just, I just always believe that if I don't see it in my hands, it doesn't exist. It's not real. Um, for the most part, uh, when it comes to money anyway. So, and I used to be one of those people like, well, I used to get a check. I get a paper check every Friday. You know, then all of a sudden they say, well, we'll just direct deposit into your account. I'm like, how is that even real? How is that even <laughs> real? Money? You know, if I if I don't see the cash in my hand or a check, I, I you know, is that safe? You know, <laughs> I was asking a lot of questions, but, you know, they say, oh, yeah, it's safe. It's safe. I'm like, oh, I don't know about that, but OK, this is the way things are going. You know, and I, I didn't have a choice in the matter, but but when I go to my bank, and I want to do some shopping. I prefer to go to my bank and I'll say, listen, um, you know, I've got, you know, $26,000 in my account. I want to take $25,000 out in cash and I'm going to go buy a house. And what I come to realize is when you go buy a house for $25,000 in cash, uh, they'll tell you, hey, you got to go back to your bank and get to get the money. You got to get a, a cashier's check for $25,000. Mm -hmm. We won't take cash. And it's like, why not? It's cash. I mean, yeah. it's, it's cash, you know? I mean, how can you, it's, it's you know, it's, I, I don't know. And then and they always come back and they say, oh, it's a security issue, you know? Um, we got, that's our way of being able to keep receipt. That's the line of, the line of thinking or the excuse. But I said, okay, all right, I'll go back to the bank. I'll say, okay, you put the money back and Say, okay, I want to get a cashier's check and then go down and give them a cashier's check and sign the papers and all that stuff and then get the house. But what's frustrating about it is it still feels fraudulent in every aspect because, like, is this really money? This feels back to the debt system, right? <clears throat> Do I actually own my own house? That's the problem. Another problem for another time, we'll talk about it, but. Uh, how we're going to, uh, how would the United Party move us out of a debt system and get us back into the system, a, a better system, or will we go back to a system like prior to the debt system? So I want to thank you guys for joining today and join this conversation with Jason. 
Um, I'm going to give Jason the last thoughts for the day. Well, I want to say thank you very much for the time. And uh, I also just want to point out that I, I am not an expert in global policy. This is just the way I view it from the everyday man that's going to have to deal with the decisions made by those who are experts in it. I just hope that they take our opinions. Again, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Have a great day. Just remember, stay blessed. Take care.